Hello, on comment. Uh, I am here today with uh, Bill DeVoe, and uh, I wanted to introduce him to our groups to, to talk about uh, what it is to be uh, an uncommon man. And we've been doing these interviews for a couple of months now, and so Bill was kind enough to make some time for us. I think you're going to have a great time listening to his input. Uh, Bill is an author and an old track coach, as he says. Uh, my brief stint with track was uh, laid to rest when someone turned around and ran backwards as fast as I was running forwards. So <laughs> that, I just That's kind of pretty ran right off the track <laughs> into the locker rooms. Let's see ya. <laughs> so uh, thanks for making some time today, brother. Absolutely. It's great to be here, TJ. It really is. Um, we always have a, a set of uh, questions we go through, but there's one thing at the end that I'd like you to talk about, and so we'll get to that right there. But our first question uh, we always go with is, uh, did you have a good role model growing up? And that is the question that sort of starts my story off, because the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And um, I... I really, from an early age, uh, through a series of events in my own family situation, intuited that it was pretty much up to me to figure life out on my own. So by the time I got to adolescence, I just, I just assumed, you, you know, you don't ask for help. You don't even look for help. So I look back on that and it was really tra tragic for me to have gone that route. It took me a long time to really begin to pick up and find worthy role models. Um, as I got into college, there were, there was a, a religion professor, I remember, that really took me by surprise. But most of my role models were not personal as I got older even. They were very much afar off. They were famous musicians or famous preachers or, you know, famous missionaries. They were just people you couldn't even, you know, right. touch even. So um, that took a lot of unwinding and unkinking uh, inside of my own heart to actually be able to um be okay with a role model so it's kind of it's kind of sad to put it that way but that that's just my story yeah I, what i've seen so far is and we've done about maybe six or eight of these videos so far and uh rarely does someone have uh, a role model they can point to and uh, i didn't as well and uh you know with no fault of those adults around me per se um, they may not have always, you know, had the best uh, uh, childhood as, as well. And so that cascaded into yep. whatever that was as an adult. And, and so once I realized it, it turned me into a realist uh, for sure. Uh, I'm a realist that leans toward optimism most mm -hmm. of the time, right? I never really lean toward negative, but I'm definitely a realist. And so uh, that has... Uh, helped me create what I call anti-role models. And so, you know, it was hard to find someone who seemed to have it all together that you know, could maybe speak into my life in a certain way. Right. I was back then I didn't, wasn't even looking for a godly counsel. Uh, but uh, I had a lot of people around me that I could learn what not to do. And unfortunately mm -hmm. that helped shape, uh, you know, my, 12 to 18 range and then once uh, i met my wife to be um, that started to change and we had children and i realized that uh, christ was my role model mm. so once that took place then it alleviated the, the need for me to look around and say man what guy has it together because no guy has it all together right i was able to uh, glean some great points from godly men around me. yeah yeah, well said. Absolutely. I think that's a lot of men do that in terms of the anti role model. Mm -hmm. I know um, men particularly didn't have good role model with their father. They spend a lot of their energy. I will not be like him. Right. And, and that in one sense, good, you're not going to be like him. But if that's your, if your only energy and driving force is that sort of negative byproduct, it's usually doesn't land you in very good places. No, it doesn't. No. Uh, luckily, I think that uh, that realist side of me took it for what it was and said, okay, I see that. I don't want to do that. I'm going to do something different. And then I came to Christ when I was about 25. And so that was what I just dove into. And so uh, I'm glad that 
you know, God had his hand on me long before I knew he had his hand on me. Yeah. Uh, but, me too. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it helped guide those steps when I was still searching for a uh, quote unquote role model. So, right. Yeah. That's fantastic. Good. Uh, our, our next one is, uh, and it's, you know, you can talk, talk about each one of them or just one of the three. Uh, how do you approach your role as a husband, dad, or leader? You know, um, I think the best way to describe that in sort of one um, centric term would simply be a servant. Mm -hmm. And I I need to sort of caption that idea by saying that when most men think about the idea of being a servant, they don't really think of that as something masculine. Mm-hmm. And usually, and I think part, you know, there's a there's a a conceptual um, error here, as well as a heart error. And I think the conceptual error is um, the idea that somehow serving uh, serving others and being a servant to someone higher than myself somehow eviscerates my masculinity. I'm not, you know, I can't be my own man. And, and I always use the example of the military. And it's like the, one of the things they drill inside of you is chain of command. Yes. You submit to your officer, period. Otherwise, there are, there are radical and ruthless consequences. Mm-hmm. And that submission actually becomes the key to you um, to you being able to fight, to be able to fight in battle. So there is this servant submission piece that actually empowers you mm. and good officers will do the same thing. They know I don't Lord it. I don't have power over these men just to use them. My power over them is, is to serve them. How can I help make what their job doing better? So even in the military, which we think is something, you know, of such power and force, this whole idea of submission and service is rooted into good military thinking and good military procedure and life. And so I I use that to say that's the conceptual error, which leads to a heart error, which I think for a lot of men being a servant feels like, well, you know, you can't really stand up for yourself, you serve other people. They would never say it that way, but they feel that they feel sort of um, conflicted about the idea of being a servant. Mm. Um, I know it's what I'm supposed to do if I'm in the church. I know it's what Christ was, but somehow it just doesn't, you know, we think, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's really the right road for me. And so, but, but I want to say again, I think a man's deep sense of strength comes when it's fully submitted yes. and serving something or someone higher than themselves. And when that strength is fully submitted, then they can look around at the people around them and go, okay, now what are you going to give me? Instead, they can go, what can I offer you in this situation? It's never going to be enough, but what can I offer you here that will be of help, benefit, service, and help you flourish? Right. And I think when a man begins to do that, he or begins to make that switch over into that arena, everything starts to change in his life because he's just looking with a new radar out around him. And he, um, he's becomes attentive and attuned to the needs of others around him Mm -hmm. to his wife. He becomes attentive and attuned to his children and he becomes attentive and attuned to those who are looking to him to lead them somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I, I think all of that is just, that's sort of when I think about the role of being a father, husband, and servant, that to me is the guts behind it. It's like there has to be this prior sense of who, who I am and whose I am. And yeah. once, once my power, my strength, my character is submitted kind of on a daily basis to, to serve him, that strength and power actually gets channeled and becomes really um, really strong. Mm. And, um, and that strength and power now is to serve those around them. So that's kind of, 
that's kind of the, you know, how it was put out the lay of the land in terms of all that. And of course, looking at my own life, you know, my story just briefly has been one of looking not so much in my children, but looking at other men and particularly at my wife more in the terms of what can I get from you? And I had to make the switch, um, you know, over the last 20 years to move into this new arena of, no, what can I offer you here? And um, I tell you, going at it that way has been so freeing, um, actually very empowering and really amazing just to watch what happens to people, people around me. And so again, it's, it's, it's Christ's way is the best way. It just, (laughs) it just is. I mean, what he says speaks truth at so many different levels and that way of letting your life go for the sake of others is, is the way of life. Every other way is ends up being sort of a way of death. Right. I love that. Um, that perspective because when you do say you know what, what can I do for you like, uh, right right I, in some fashion the look on people's faces they're like they're not expecting that they never get asked that and so in a very small way my wife and I over the last maybe month or two uh, every time we walk up to uh, a cashier whatever we are and we're checking out I always ask how are you doing today Right. And inevitably, every single one of them either say, I'm fine. They're kind of like startled that I've asked that question. Or they say, you know what? No one asks us how we're doing. Right. We're always, you know, instructed to ask, oh, you having a good day today? That kind of thing. And so I've been doing that just to see, you know, well, my check up conversation. You know, you never know where it's going to go. Uh, but also just the... Um, you know, change that that radar, right? And you start to change that perspective right. of um, here I am. Look at me, right? Look at me, right? Um, man, you know, supposed to be competitive, and you know, like, hey, if you at a red light and a car pulls up next to you, and all of a sudden they inch up a little bit, you just want to inch up a little bit closer, right? That's right. I'm closer to the light now than you are. Right. Right. But you know, just from a life perspective of um, that that change in uh, perspective of what could I do to serve those around me? And right. I was talking to one of our charter leaders today about about an hour ago, and he was talking about a topic, and we finished it up. And before he let me go, he's like, "Hold on a second, hold on a second. What can I do for you? How can I help?" And like you know, sometimes you know we're like burning candle at both ends, and all of a sudden got you know something in the middle going too. Uh, it caught me off guard a little bit, and I'm like, uh, you know what? Uh, there's a lot I could use your help with, and so uh, I asked for some help here and there. But uh, it's great to hear that the men of Uncommon who are intimately involved with leading their groups um, even call me and say, you know, what can I do? And so right. that, that resonates with me. So that's yeah, funny. yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, it's it's been a game changer perspective for me. Excellent, excellent. Um, so this is where Bill gets all famous on us, right? This is where Bill leaves the, hey, it's Bill kind of thing to, it's Bill, right? <laughs> uh, Bill, uh, now, uh, you want to talk a little bit about some of the books you've written and where you kind of, where they're at and your, your, your ministry in general? Sure. Um, uh, uh, well, first, I like to say my only claim to fame is having a wife who's put up with me for 33 years. <laughs> that every other claim to fame is f- ephemeral, non-existence, or doesn't count. So <laughs> that's that's my only claim to fame, and my two amazing daughters. Um, so yeah, the book. So uh, first, uh, being an author was a complete surprise. It was not. In fact, I had a woman who was an author, and I, when I was a high school teacher and coach, she sat me down to dinner one time when I had her uh, son as a student and basically said, you know, you really need to think about writing. And basically, in, in a nice way, I said, I'm a high school teacher. I'm flattered you think I have something that people would want to read. But honestly, I don't have time to do this. Right. And I blew her off. Oh, wow. And it took a number of other incidents 
it's for me to begin to really have the courage to just write. And of course, like all um, authors, you know, my first attempts were met with, you know, not interested rejection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, the, the whole writing thing and the author thing over time has become uh, just kind of a crazy adventure. Um, all of my books are really about a journey. And they're all about the journey we need to take in order to become uh, the people that God sees us as. And um, so in general, that's what they're all about. The first book um, called Landmarks really dealt with kind of a big picture journey um, with sort of nine landmarks to negotiate to follow Christ. And then the next book was called Divided, When the Head and Heart Don't Agree. And that was just about the journey to close that gap that every one of us feels. And then this last book that just came out is a book for men called Heroic, um, The Surprising Path to True Manhood. And that really is about the masculine journey and the way Christ intersects that journey and calls us out to be heroic in his way. So that's in general what they're about. Wow. I love the, the concept. I haven't read any of these books here, guys, but because um, Bill and I just met maybe like about a week or two ago. Uh, but uh, the one, the, the divided one, really piques my curiosity. Um, that 18 inches from your heart to your head that many times, boy, it might as well. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. You know, Earth and Mars, that at the distance that it has to travel to make sense. Right. Um, uh, but there is one part of the uh, heroic book that stood out to me. And that is the topic on silence. Would you like to give us a little snippet of the, the concept of silence? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I'll give a little spoiler alert here. Really, the whole heroic book is, uh, I call it a subversive manifesto for silence. <laughs> and, and I don't really talk about that until the end of the book, but literally everything in the book is sort of leading you to that point. And the heroic journey in literature and the journey <clears throat> Jesus has calls us out on to become heroic and really the journey and the manhood or as, as I try and frame the book, they're all the same thing. Mm. And um, they're all pictures of the same thing. And so the way in which we start the journey, stay on the journey and keep the, the journey's goal in mind and be empowered for that journey and really even understand, I think even more critically who we are in our identity and the quest we're supposed to take really what we're supposed to do with our lives. Really. And all of that is really best conceived and best experienced and best guided by cultivating what I call interior silence. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is I look at the world like the old movie, The Matrix, um, which is, you know, the, the world. Yeah. Yeah. The world basically is telling us certain things are true about life and there's it's screaming at us all the time but actually so much of it is a fog it's ephemeral it's deceptive or it's just an outright lie mm. and we only gain our sanity and our real perspective on, on who we are in god's eyes and what we're supposed to do in our lives and really be empowered for that journey when we simply choose to enter regular silence wow. and when we, we unplug from the matrix, mm. we step out of it. We, um, we disassociate ourselves from it. And, you know, I, I knew I was on, and again, this is all a surprise to me. I knew I was onto something about this when I taught in high school, a class called men of the Bible. And I just wanted them to, have a personal sort of experiential education. And so when we got to the topic of uh, your relationship with God, I'm like, you know, I don't want to talk about this in the classroom. So there was a nearby park and I took him out there, gave him a Bible and a couple of verses. And I just said, find a quiet place, 15 minutes, just be silent. And I can't tell you how many of the students would come back and say, that was one of the most profound things we ever did in the class. Right. And so I knew I was onto something because I wasn't telling them anything. They weren't doing, in fact, they were doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I simply asked them to begin to be attentive to their hearts, begin to be attentive to nature around them and begin to be attentive to God. Mm -hmm. 
and simply pray and begin to speak to him using scripture and then what was coming up inside of their hearts. And um, so that's how really my journey into like, okay, there's something really important here really started. And that's just grown over the years to where I am a uh, absolute, it's one of my firm convictions that interior sense of being a man is only grounded in the silence. Mm. I mean, all the other things can be ancillary and helpful, but if that's not there, there is a void that cannot be filled with anything else. Yeah. And, yeah. Hard to fill a cup that's brimming with water, right? I mean, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly. That's a great point. Yeah, you become an overflow. So yeah. for me, so much of my ministry, honesty, and what I do in my work is really help men lead them into silence, where they can really meet and really experience the living Christ and really um, experience whatever He has for them in that moment, and that that He has something personal for them. Right. It's not, it's not generic blessing. It's personal to them and their circumstances and their story. And, you know, it is, uh, um, it's just a real game changer for men when they begin to grab a hold of that. So, um, yeah, so that's just one of the things I do is uh, help men in terms of, uh, you know, helping them take them into interior silence. And I have to say this, men are fascinated by that idea, I find. But the other thing I find so interesting, a lot of men feel a little ang anxious about like really unplug like for, you know, even an hour right. or so I'll do, I do this thing called a, a day of silence, like really unplug for seven hours, like and do nothing. And I find a lot of men have either mild anxiety about that idea all the way up to literal terror. Like, who am I? What am I if I unplug? from everything. And they're so tied to the matrix that to unplug feels like I would become nothing. And I go, and my response to that is, no, no, you won't become nothing. You're just getting ready to meet God. Mm. Oh, wow. I love that. Because think about it. I mean, <clears throat> we're so inundated by stimulant from phones, TV, music, you know, just, you know, those around us. I mean, I'm the only child, so I've been pretty comfortable being alone, you know. And but there's a difference of, you know, going off by yourself and getting silent because unless you're just talking to yourself or talking out loud to God, you may look a little weird just walking around or sitting right. and talking to yourself. But there's also uh, like like this, like when you're speaking, you know, I'm being silent so I can understand what you're saying and trying to grasp that concept and so right, that right. communication that God wants to have with you. If you are constantly chattering, da, 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 right. you know, and I think that how people communicate uh, with each other is uh, a bit of a reflection, how they communicate with God. I have a, a gentleman in my life that, um, holy cow, he just does not like <clears throat> any kind of silence. If the conversation drops off at, at any any point like more than a, a second or two he just has to keep talking and uh i feel bad because it, eventually he runs out of stuff to talk about and then all of a sudden becomes very i don't know um agenda based or like he's trying to to i don't know discover things to talk about and some of those things just don't go in, in a really good place and so uh we had worked with a uh, a pastoral retreat in Idaho and we we're doing their website and uh, it's meant for pastors to go out there and spend a week just unplugging and getting in touch with God. And right. so uh, I, I love that concept because, uh, you know, getting on the sofa and watching a ball game, that's not getting silent. No, it's not. No, um, uh, your drive to work with the radio off, that's not silent either. You're, you're still driving. You know, it's intentional to get quiet someplace to listen, you know, that the still small voice can't hear that if you're, you're rambling. And so um, that, that stuck out to me when I was looking at, uh, some of your stuff there. Oh yeah. Well, it's well said TJ it really is. Yeah. It's, um, 
you know, the Lord might just have something he wants to say to you. And if, you know, <laughs> yeah, I think that, uh, I am always under construction. You know, if, if, yeah, sometimes I say, you know, if we, if you talk to somebody the way you talk to God, how would that go off? Mm. Like you're just, even in our prayer, we're constantly talking. I mean, that we do need to request and give thanks. And I mean, all those are scriptural and understandable and right and proper, but it's like, you know, what about just being silent and trying to listen? Like if you carried on a conversation and you just, what would the other person think if it was just a monologue the whole time? I know. It's just, you just would, you would just go, stop. This is not a relationship. You know, this is. I didn't even be here for this conversation. Yeah, I know, that's right. Yeah, you just. Yeah. You're going to have it without me. Here. <laughs> that's right. So it's just cultivating that awareness of, you know, he really is here and he's really present. And. Uh, in that he's already working in you. And so c- becoming aware of that is priceless. Mm, mm. And it's a really, I it's really the core and the nub of masculinity. Oh, sorry. Good. Say that again. Say that again. No, I just say it's the core and the nub of masculinity. It's, it's the one thing. It's just like, what? No, 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 no it really is. Mm, it okay. really, really is. I think the, I think the core of masculinity has, is, been it, it's bruised and bleeding on the side of the road somewhere today. I mean, it's just if it, if it's not under attack from uh, outside, we do a fair job of our own, you know, uh, distortion inside. Yeah. Well, and so um, we try to help uh, pick that masculinity up off the ground, dust it off, and see if we can reposition it to be. Hey, look, you're supposed to be like Christ you're good enough to be you know and so God made you you know worthy of him and so um uh yeah uh, masculinity these days are uh it feels like it's a (laughs) ever-changing um definition when actually it was defined back in Genesis and so right I I would like to ask and and impose a favor on you uh sure for a selfish reason, uh, I would love to get a copy of the book Divided. I would love a, a copy of that. Um, where could I find those those books at? You know what? Why don't um, uh, the, the the Divided all three of those books you can find on Amazon um, oh. and and at um, and then the Divided and Heroic are found at all sorts of other you know, online retailers nice. too as well. So, yeah, I want to take and um, uh, get that because we're always writing content, right? And so yep. I always try to, you know, uh, expose myself to as much you know, godly men as I can and uh, see what I'm, I'm a gleaner by nature, you know, so I get someplace and someone's talking and, uh, you know, like when you're talking about that, that separation and the, and would you say that when the heart and mind disagree? Yeah, don't agree, right? Don't yeah. agree. Uh, and my my brain's already saying that's a blog post. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, do it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to steal that a little bit from you, but um, I sit in my uh, in in church on Sundays, and uh, I got my my I use Olive Tree for my Bible app. But uh, when something just like you know impresses me about you know a topic or whatever concept. Out comes my notes, and I have this pages and pages of topics that I'm going to write about. So uh, it never goes away. But uh, wow, is one that is uh, uh, definitely resonating with me. Yeah. So. Well, good. Well, it's uh, you know again, I, I wrote it because it's it's so much of my own story. Mm. So trying to trying that's to get that 18 inch gap to close a bit. So <laughs> well, that's the best kind of stories. That, you know, kind of put yourself in that you can relate to very much, very much. So, you know, I'm trying to, these interviews, I'm trying to convey to guys that everybody's got a broken road. I mean, there is no straight and narrow path, right. Other than the gospel, right. Our lives are this broken mess that, you know, somehow by the grace of God that, you know, many of us have had the joy of uh, knowing Christ. And so, um, you know, these interviews are uh, targeted to that topic. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well said. We all have a story. And the most amazing thing is God takes the, 
all the even worst and even most shameful parts of our story and turns them into something that's actually shining and beautiful and redemptive and healing for everybody else. That's the, that's the, like, that just what feels like what was completely impossible is possible. So having a face for radio in a dark room, if he can use me to do something. <laughs> so. That's right. I get that. Well said. Well said. Well, brother, uh, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, oh, sure. It's a joy. I love what y'all are doing too. Keep oh, it up, man. Keep it up. So, so needed. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, we, we appreciate all the, the encouragement we get from guys, especially other men's ministries around us, because there's yep. so many out there and we never look at them as that's my competition. Right. I'm one inch closer to the red light. Right. It's, not, it's never that. It's no. like this. I want guys to, you know, listen to this and say, man, that resonates with me. I right. need to go find right. that book or contact Bill and see what I can learn to right. step into the silence. And so, um, you know, uh, we, we counsel many of our church clients, that same thing, that church down the road is not trying to steal your people. Uh, That's right. Same team. <laughs> for the glory of God and the kingdom, right? You know, That's so. right. <laughs> but, uh, brother, thank you again for your time. And, uh, uh, uncommon guys, uh, be sure to look out for Bill's stuff. Go find his books. What I'll do is I will put a link down below to uh, those book titles on Amazon and uh, see if you guys can pick up a copy and um, sound like you can be blessed. So thanks, Bill. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Same here, man. Bye-bye.